So, um, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, this is uh, quite a story. There's a lot of people worked in this. So you can see the nice logos of the Erasmus MC, the LUMC, TU Delft. Um, a lot of cooperation went into this. Um, and I want to give people credit, because in, in academia, it's all about credit. Uh, if you don't get credit, you don't get funding. So uh, I'll talk about some of the people who worked on this. Uh, in fact, uh, one, of the key, uh, one of the key people was, in fact, Henry Vroman. He submitted uh, a suggestion uh, to make use of light paths and to make use of the uh, cloud uh, development. And we were able to kind of piggyback on top of that. And the idea was to create a system, as you'll see later, where we could collaborate between the various UMCs and also the TU Delft. And the, uh, the whole system was very much uh, triggered by ideas from Charles Bota and Julien Millet, who unfortunately have left to go and do other things in industry. Um, but many other people worked. And, and I, can't, uh, I must mention, in fact, all the, the UMC ICT people because this is quite a difficult project, and we'll come to that later. The UMC is a very secure environment, and without their cooperation, we wouldn't have been able to set this up and, and get it going. And of course, all the people from SURF who helped, uh, because it was totally a totally new environment for me and for anybody else, and uh, I needed a lot of help uh, to get all these things running. So what are we going to be talking about today? Population imaging. Uh, Sylvia's already mentioned that uh, we're going to well, look at some pictures later of the brain, but it's not just about imaging, even though I work in a, in a division of image processing. In fact, this is about visual analysis of data. So uh, brain images are just one of the things we visually analyze. We also, I'll show later, uh, we'll be looking into genetic data. That's one of the big things for the fu uh, currently and in the future. Uh, one of our issues, as I've already mentioned, UMC data protection, the infrastructure which made it all possible. I'll explain how that came about. And also the prototype architecture which we uh, created. And uh, we've done some real science with it. And we've also made uh, a little demo, which I've got a video of at the end. So population imaging genetics, neurological disease. What have we got? We're looking for uh, risk factors. They could be genetic risk factors, environmental risk factors, risk factors to do with behavior. These result in some kind of uh, outcome, stroke. These days, we can do a, lo a lot of genetic uh, screening of people. This is uh, what's called a Manhattan diagram at the bottom. Now, I don't know if you know what's uh, the possibilities these days. There are things called DNA microarrays. You can take uh, DNA samples and put on, on these arrays, and you can look for uh, what are called SNPs, which are single point failures within the DNA. You can also look and see which genes are being expressed. You get actually mountains of data about a single individual. Um, it's a real, well, people say a needle in a haystack. It's a needle in a tsunami of data. So that's uh, one place. And then also, Traditional imaging modalities, they also produce lots and lots of data. So uh, we've got some pictures at the bottom here. We can see, uh, I think actually we just pointed out, you can see things like uh, lesions here in the white matter of the brain and here, and uh, various other issues, possibly microbleeds or strokes. So all these, all these things produce a tremendous amount of data, and we're trying to look for what are the connections between this data and the particular outcomes. This is... Uh, this is all. Ultimately, what we want to get is something called a, a biomarker. A biomarker is a collection of uh, data points. And, and you can think of all these things and affect all these different measurements as dimensions. So we want some sort of, as it were, along each dimension, we want some number, some point where we say, well, if you've reached this point here, 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 and here, this biomarker altogether, this says, uh, this says that you've got a particular chance of a disease, or there's, uh, or not, as the case may be. Um, so yeah, it's a matter of putting together all this information. These slides, by the way, courtesy of our friends in uh, in Erasmus. The bottom line is, however, that we have all these thousands of scans. We have lots of genetic information, but. In order to get the biomarkers out reliably, in order to have the statistical significance, and not just to publish a paper in, in a journal, which you can do with relatively small numbers of subjects, but to create a biomarker that can also be used in the clinic, you need a lot more data. So one of the things we have to do is to be able to pool data from 
many different hospitals. And this part of this project is to try and do that. Um, you mentioned the data is not just of one type. It can be genetic. It can be imaging. We need to look at ways at systems which allow us to combine that. And we also need to find a way in which we can share between partners the different UMCs who've put a lot of effort into collecting this data and a lot of money into collecting the data. How do we let them share that data in a way in which they feel confident the data is not being stolen? We'd much prefer if the data remained in the hospital and isn't copied somewhere. And there's good reasons for this. It's not that it's not that we're awful people that we don't want to share data. We do want to share our data, but it's all about credit, in fact. And that's, again, how you get, get funding. Uh, one of the... Uh, I'll come back to that point actually later uh, in, in, the, in this talk. So we're looking for a system that uh, gives us secure data transport, but doesn't, let us, doesn't give away the data. Um, we want it to be fast. And we want to ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is, when you see something interesting in, one of our, in an analysis, that you can drill down to the original data and look at that brain scan or look at that uh, Manhattan diagram of the GWAS study and see is that uh, actually relevant. So let's talk about computing in a, U a UMC. Why, why, is that, uh, why is that difficult? Well, it's a very secure environment. Um, there's uh, the data legislation in the EU is called something like EC9546 or something, but that's basically the thing that guarantees data protection. It's kind of the Bible for our, our ICT people. I mean, all your data when you go into a hospital, it just can't be taken outside. We've got firewalls, um, everything to stop the data getting out, but it also means we're, st we're stuck with whatever computing power we have in the UMC. And as UMCs, we also have limited budget to buy that computing power, so we can't just buy in supercomputers. We need to find a way of effectively using shared uh, computing power. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is our problem. So we know how to, do we know how to make this uh, local computing uh, environment secure, but it's limited. It's limited in CPU power. Um, what, what can we do about that? Well, the idea was, the idea of uh, Professor Leilifeld and, and Julia Mie and Charles, they, they thought, well, what if we could have this, in a sense, a distributed PC? So we'd like to connect um, the data providers in a secure manner. So we're going to use light paths for that. These are, these are physically secure. We can connect them in a star network. You already saw this in one of the videos where somebody went from uh, Utrecht to Amsterdam to Groningen. We're doing exactly the same thing here. We have our data. It remains actually in the UMCs. We do our processing centrally, and we can do some visualization in the TU, in TU Delft. They were helping us with doing visualization here. Um, we want computing that scales, so the great thing about this project is we were able to get access to the uh, cloud system in SARA, and you can get that in nice small sizes, medium, large, or extra large, we can, if we've really got a lot of data we want to process. So now we've got, a, we've, now we've got this kind of virtual PC, stretched at least over, at the moment, to part of the Randstad, um, but it's still secure, and that's great. And now we've got something they can maybe sell to uh, our ICT people and also to our clinical researchers who put all, all the effort into collecting that data, is this meets all your requirements. Your data remains with you. Nobody can get in from the outside. This is fantastic. Let's take a little step back to, the, to how we got this so far. This was actually, as I said, um, originally Henry Vroman. He won an award. Uh, we were able to get hold of this uh, uh, infrastructure for free, in fact, as... as uh, as part of this award. He uh, made the suggestion, implementation of a centralized image processing unit to support analysis in large-scale population imaging. And we were able to get hold of uh, 20,000 uh, core hours of computing time on the cloud and these light paths, which you've already seen in the, in the previous diagram. So we're going to focus, the, the idea of this, this study is to focus on screening uh, populations for uh, disease. So there's some nice, uh, we've got some nice jury comments on that as well. Let's just go on. Let's look a little bit more. Look at the geography again. Uh, this is a, a smaller version of what we just saw. The great thing about, uh, I think, in the future, I mean, this is not just limited to what we set up now with uh, two UMCs, is I think in the future we can basically expand this nationwide. My understanding is that this, uh, these light paths, 
can take us over the whole Netherlands and perhaps even outside. I mean, I see cross-border links here. Perhaps there's a, the, there's a potential to use this for collaboration cross-border. Who knows? I haven't asked, talked about that yet, but it's in our minds. So what did we build? Let's, let's go to our network architecture. So there's a few key things I'd like to point out here. This is uh, the Erasmus MC and LUMC over here. There's actually a subtle difference in the way we connected. The red line is the is a secure light path. And at the top here, we have the cloud service with some head node, which we've uh, created. And we make virtual machines uh, inside our own private network. So all this is secure, this is secure, this is secure. Our problem is, when we talk to our ICT people, is will they let us connect this to the hospital network? And in fact, they were convinced that the security here was good enough and that this private network is good enough. And in fact, all the control over the uh, systems here is well enough controlled within SURF that we were allowed to link it here into through the LMC firewall to an access point machine, which stood on the internal hospital network. In Erasmus, they did that a little bit differently because they actually have a, a so-called demilitarized zone or a research network. So they actually brought it down into this and uh, the hospital network is actually separate. But this is actually quite an important uh, achievement here on its own. The hospitals, of course, they can contact the regular internet out here and, and so on. But uh, this link itself is, is actually one of, one of the things we we're proudest of. It wasn't easy to get this going because, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Professor Vroman, he, he set this up to do a particular project and we were kind of piggybacking on, it, on top of this. So initially, the, uh, the settings in the uh, private network in the cloud, that took a bit of coordination between the various uh, ICT departments to get those working for both sides. Uh, so something like this is, uh, comes with its own problems. We've learned a lot from them. So anybody else is doing it, uh, it's certainly come along by us. How did we build this? Well, the important thing is, well, it's already been mentioned, uh, don't get into the not invented here uh, syndrome. You just don't have time. They're, they're, and there's lots of really good uh, free and open source software out there. I've mentioned some things we've used here. Um, some of it supply, supplied by Surfsara themselves. You have to be a little bit cautious, of course, in bringing in uh, open source. Uh, any software package you bring in uh, always brings more with it, can have particular problems. Um, in our case, it turned out to be quite successful. I had a very, when I started building this, I had a fairly clear idea of what I wanted to do, the architecture I wanted to, to achieve. And I think of all of these things, there's, there's only really two things I have doubts over, and the biggest one being uh, the Condor, which we used, which is a Sun, Sun Grid Engine like scheduling system. It's a, more of a push system, and for, the, uh, for what the system we made previously, where we actually have a a head node and virtual machines, we should really have more of a pool system for scheduling onto the virtual machines. But that aside, that's something I can fix in the next version. Um, so this has uh, turned out to be a very flexible system. One of the, one of the good things as well, let's just go back to the previous slide. We designed this as well, but important is also how do you test something like this? I mean, I didn't want to be burning uh, cloud hours all the time in trying to test this to, to get it working. So it was also important to create the architecture in a way that we could also run it locally, even without the VM part. Um, so this was, in fact, all set up so that it would work on our local Blade server as well. So I could actually run this locally before I uploaded to the cloud. So it's actually quite important part, it's just the technical side of getting something like this going. So let's look at the architecture in some more detail. So we see here's our head node and our uh, worker nodes over here. So these are, in fact, uh, virtual machine images. And this is, again, something that I, I, I decided on fairly early was to try and minimize uh, components. So in fact, I'm using exactly the same virtual machine image for the head node as the worker nodes. It just so happens that when the head node uh, is created. It uses a uh, contextualizing template that makes it come up as a head node and the others come up as worker nodes. It's very simple, but it means you're, not, you're only managing one, uh, one particular template, one particular um, image. The other thing that's important here is that this system be extensible. So we designed the architecture with uh, a standard uh, 
pipeline interface where you can plug in extra pipelines. Uh, and this is actually important because one of the things we did with this, even without the using the light path, was we, we wrote a paper where we processed some images. You can see here ADNI pipeline. We actually processed some uh, standard brain images and we were able to publish on that. So even when building the system, we were already able to do some science with it, which is uh, very nice. Um, so any other important points here? Yeah, this is the, the key thing here. We're going to mount uh, the subject data via the light path in the final version. Of course, in an intermediate uh, version, when we didn't have the light path up and running, we could actually load data in a different way. And especially in this case, when we were using for ADNI, that's publicly available data. So we didn't have the privacy issues. Let's just go on. Just to summarize the uh, software architecture here. So we've got VMs in the cloud. Um, we've got a, a Python-based infrastructure, lots of uh, open source involved. Ultimately, our data is mounted over the light path. And our visualization, I haven't talked about that yet, but in fact, again, we're going to use fairly standard components for that. We're using IPython and SciPy. And recently, we've actually added in a new um, pipeline, which is called TSNE, which solves this problem of how do you visualize one of these multidimensional problems. And I'll talk about some more, a little bit about that during the, the demo. So here's our, here's our pilot setup. So to actually get this running, we, um, we also use some publicly available data. So in principle, uh, privacy is not such an issue, but we set it up as if we were using uh, real patient data called the OASIS data set. We put half the scans in Erasmus and half the scans on Leiden storage. And what we did was what's called a pairwise registration, and I'll explain shortly what that is, of 66 uh, brains. So every brain is compared in a particular way with uh, every other in the 66 uh, sets. This, um, each one of these registrations or comparisons takes uh, 15 minutes. And in total, you have to do over 2,000 of them. So in fact, it would take about 500 hours. In practice, this took about 8, 10 hours or so because we were able to allocate a uh, rather a large number of VMs. And at the end, we can do some visualization of this data, and you'll see that shortly. And we can drill down to the original imaging data. So this is our pipeline. It's a bit, uh, a bit technical, but it just a couple of things I want to point out. Out of this pipeline, we compare two subjects. At the end of it, we can either get a single measure of the amount of difference between these two subjects, or we can actually get two um, basically transformation, deformation fields. And both of these, we can either use this, which is a single uh, number, so it's not so small, so you end up with uh, a sort of a 30-something uh, a dimensional prob problem. But in this case, if you use these, you end up with a many million dimensional problem, but we can handle actually both of those with some nice uh, machine learning techniques. So let's just uh, go over to the demo, and I'll uh, talk through that. So in this demonstration, I'd like to oh. introduce you to, I'll just uh, switch that off. So here we're looking at uh, two brains that are being compared. If you look at the brain on the, the left-hand side there, you'll actually see that the ventricles are much bigger and also the sulci are much broader than the brain on this side. So basically, this, is, this may come from an older person or a diseased person. So these are, these are typical of these uh, brains in the, in the set of 66 that we're compar uh, comparing. So if you have to deform one to the other, and if we look up the top here, where the cursor is just there, you can actually see that you've got areas of high deformation and areas of low deformation. And it basically corresponds to the areas here in the white matter, where the white matter has been untouched and the areas around the outside where it's shrinking in. So this is typically what we get. These deformation fields, like the original images, are 256 by 256 by uh, 128. But actually, to do this experiment, we, uh, we subsampled this down by about a factor, of, a factor of eight just to make it smaller. But even so, that means that for each subject, we have effectively about a million dimensions going across. 
So I mentioned that we have some of these uh, multi-dimensional scaling techniques that help us deal with the, these huge amou amounts of dimensions. Not going into detail of how that works, but what you can kind of think is that what we try to do is visualize something in a lower number of dimensions and show clusters in the lower number of dimensions that correspond to the clustering that exists in the higher dimensionality. And um, so that, that in itself is quite tricky, and there are a lot of parameters to choose. So this is one of the reasons we actually added in our TS and E into the, as a pipeline, because we want to do many parameter sweeps and generate lots of these kind of diagrams, which you see with the different clusters appearing. So this is a particular parameter in TSNE called perplexity. And it's producing various, you can sort of see clusters emerging here. You can see a cluster emerging here, maybe a couple of clusters here. And so basically what we want to do is sweep over these millions of dimensions, try lots of things, and eventually come out and see what gives us actually the best clear clustering. So once we've got something like this, you can imagine that in the, the user interface, this is what we do, and then the user can go through many pages of these graphs, pick on one of them. In this case, we're going to pick on the perplexity uh, 21 and actually uh, look at that in a bit more detail. So I think I should come up just now. Let me see. Let me just scroll forward a bit. So here we go. So this is, uh, so this is our graph in a bit more uh, zoomed in. So you can see, actually, we can project into two dimensions or three dimensions. So you'll actually see here you can, uh, in the three-dimensional one, funnily enough, it's only collected two clusters. And by mistake, I've clicked on one of them. So you can see you can actually drill down to the original data. And here you've got actually two clusters. Over here, you've got three clusters. So let's go and have a look at uh, explore this data. And this is exactly uh, what we want to do. We can just see if we click on. Uh, I'll just move this off to one side. As soon as we click, uh, choose a point here, we'll go into the, uh, the black uh, cluster at the top. As soon as we click on a point here, what's going to happen is, in fact, the original data is going to be picked up from the hospital immediately over the light path. So I go click, and that's the speed it comes up at. It's about a second delay or so. So that's really nice. So we've got a system where we're processing the data in the background on the cloud. We're able to call up uh, data. We'll call up another one from the same. Uh, we can scroll through these, of course. This is rather nice. You can just click on another piece of data here. Up oh, pops uh, another visualization. So this is. Um, it looks quite simple. You're clicking on points and data is coming up, but you have to realize everything is coming over these light paths from the two original hospitals. And it doesn't matter which uh, hospital that patient, uh, that subject, is in. If you click down in this green cluster, we see something rather interesting. So you see these look a little bit odd. And this actually shows the significance of this cluster. This is one I happen to know from beforehand. In fact, what's happened here is we've had a failure in our pre-processing. One of the things we have to do is called brain extraction or skull stripping. And here it's failed, and it's actually left rather a lot of the neck area on here. So in fact, this whole little green cluster is not really telling us much about the, uh, the disease profile of these patients. In fact, this is not a real study at all, but uh, it's more to demonstrate the, uh, the architecture. But it does actually show how it works and how you can very easily, from the dimensions, create meaningful clusters. So we can go on through and, and uh, click on various other things. So that's more or less what I wanted to show you. So if there are any uh, questions, I'll be happy to take them. Sure. <coughs> what are you particularly after? Is it uh, Kreutzfeld Jakob or Korsakov? Or the, uh, you showed something, uh, somebody with large holes in his brain. Uh, well, what, uh, what, what comes out? 
effectively here we've only looked at uh, we've looked at brain data, but you have to realize we can also combine this with the, with the genetic information as well. And um, so instead of just so I'm clicking on a, on a point here, you're seeing a brain, but actually what you want to see is the brain plus the genetic information, and sort of look at that within one of these groups that we've actually seen here. And the, the hope is that well, what will happen is if we have enough patients that we can actually get some relevant biomarker, some cluster which, which is associated with a particular disease. That's where we want to get to. Yeah. Am I right that you uh, do basically matching or correlation uh, between images and in that pipeline? Um, so in the pipeline itself is uh, we register one image to the other, register, uh, and basically, that's, yes, that's what we do. So effectively, you're deforming one image into the other. So what I showed at the start was a kind of a deformation field. Uh, yeah. yeah it's correlation. Um, effectively, it comes down to correlation. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the single dissimilarity uh, measure, that's a, that's a measure of correlation in a sense, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Baller. Thank you. <laughs>